Hi, I'm Dr. Cassie from NABC's Vetfolio and the host of vet to vet Today we're discussing equine protozoal myeloencephalitis, or EPM. And this can be a frustrating and sometimes devastating neurological disease in horses. Here to discuss prevention and treatment of EPM is Dr. Philip von Harveld. Dr. Van Harveld founded and operated Vermont Large Animal Clinic, an equine field service and surgical referral hospital for more than 22 years. He's an expert in all things equine. And Phil, thank you for joining me. So happy to have you here to talk about what can be a little bit of a tricky condition. Hey, thank you so much for having me. No, I agree. This can be a very frustrating disease to horse owners. And I think having some level of education about how we go about diagnosing and treating this condition can be of big benefit to horses. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, kind of starting with the basics, can you remind us about the pathophysiology of EPM? Yeah, so the pathophysiology starts with uh, the causative organisms. So there's two organisms that are recognized, uh, Sarcosis neurona, which is the more popular organism, but there's a, a second organism, Neospora euhesi, that we don't know much about. We actually don't know the life cycle of that organism, but we do have testing for it and we do have treatment for it. Interesting. Yeah, I only remember Sarcosis neurona from school. Yes. And, um, you know, but we sort of use this life cycle of sarcocystis still as the, the baseline for a lot of what we do, since we do have recognition of clinical signs and diagnosis and treatment for neospora. So we are still able to help horses, no matter which organism is causing the disease at this point. Good news. Good news. And like we talked about, this can be quite a devastating disease. It can be kind of tricky to treat it and prevent it. Um, so, you know, I guess, Kind of my next question would be, how common is this? What do we know about the seroprevalence of these different organisms in the U.S.? So the seroprevalence can be pretty high. Um, There's regions, especially for sarcosystis, like the southeast, for example, that you can have prevalence up to 85% of horses can test positive. But the thing to always remember is that only about 1% of horses that really get exposed to the organism in ideal conditions will actually develop the neurologic version of this disease. So the incidence isn't very high. And sort of the, the guilty culprit in all of this is really, at least for sarcosystis, is the opossum. I, they are the animal that sheds what we call, it's a similar thing as eggs, right, in parasites, but we call them actually sporocysts. Um, in these little guys, and they are the ones that will shed these eggs um, around the farm where horses get exposed to it. And these opossums are pretty prolific at it. One opossum can carry up to 250 million of these eggs in their system, and they can shed between 30 and 600,000 of those in a single day. I feel like the horses don't stand a chance. I know. Again, it can be tricky. Yeah. And the the, the opossum is one component of this, so they sort of shed these uh, sporocysts, so eggs, into the environment. Um, but the life cycle of this organism sort of consists of two aspects to it. The first one is the opossum, where, you know, sort of sexual reproduction happens of this organism, and they shed the sporocysts in the environment to horses. But then you also have an intermediate host, which includes like the skunk, the raccoon, even the cat. And they can also get infected by this. And that's where they develop these, you know, they have the asexual reproduction of this organism and they develop in their muscle these infective sarcocysts. And that's where the name of the, the disease comes from. And they sort of, you know, it doesn't affect their lives too much. Um, but when these animals, these intermediate hosts die, then their carcasses are laying around and, and opossums will eat on dead carcasses. And when they eat on those dead carcasses, then they eat those sarcosis and then the cycle completes itself. But it's always important to note, you know, that the horse is sort of what we call an aberrant host of this disease. You know, they're like a dead end host. So they do get the downfall of the disease, but they're not part of the life cycle. Okay. Okay. Compli like I guess not not an incredibly complicated life cycle, but just kind of this nope. this circular pattern, and then horses are just kind of this branch off to the side. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. So thinking about horses, are there particular risk factors to be aware of that might make a horse more prone to developing EPM? Yes, we do have some of those. Um, so 
risk factors include hay storage that's not secured from wildlife. You know, if you have an opossum that can roam through the barn or where your hay is and, and shed all these sporocysts. And the thing to remember too, these sporocysts can live up to a year in the environment. So even though they get shedded a lot, they're around for a while. If you have wooded terrain around the premises where the opossum habitats are encouraged, and especially if you have a horse that sort of resides on the farm, doesn't really leave the farm, has been living there for a while, and those horses develop EPM, then you sort of know that you have the organism based at your location. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what about grazing horses? Are they going to pick it up from grazing? I know you mentioned um, hay, hay that's not secured. What about if they're if they're just grazing in a field? Yes, they can, because that's sort of where the those, uh, uh, you know, where these opossums sort of shed their fecal material, it's sort of what this gets sort of shed everywhere. And then when they're exposed to these porosis, then usually we, we tend to see, um, you know, a recent stress event in horses, which sort of predisposes the likelihood of that infection to occur. Things like surgery, um, an adverse health event, parturition, but especially transportation um, can sort of, you know, dip their immune system just a little bit that it makes more likely for these organisms to cross from being in their system and to cross into the CNS. And then once it crosses that into the CNS is when we see the classical clinical signs. But what you can say is that typically the prime candidate for EPM is a young performance horse. They sort of meet all the requirements to get the disease. Absolutely. And, and probably a lot of transportation for them. Yes, absolutely. So what are some of the clinical signs in a horse with EPM? How do we recognize this? So the, the clinical signs vary a little bit. So there's two points of entry for this organism into the CNS. So if you sort of get, you know, into that spinal cord region um, where you sort of get mostly lower motor neuron clinical signs, then you're going to see the classic asymmetry, ataxia, atrophy of their muscles, you know, sort of those lower motor neuron clinical signs. But if it sort of goes into the central CNS, then you can have horses with head tilts and cranial nerves deficits. So it's a, a little bit more of an intense case in that scenario. So those horses can eventually actually go down you know, and not be able to get up anymore and seizures. So the port of entry plays a role into, is this a more simple lower motor neuron kind of case, or is this a more advanced, you know, like central nervous system case? And when you talked about the lower motor neuron presentation, you mentioned asymmetry. Is that a characteristic of EPM, like something that would really point us in that direction? It is, because when this organism enters, it is, you know, it picks randomly where it starts to replicate and it's the replication of the organism because they're ob ob obligate intracellular organisms. The way that what they do is they infect neurological cells. They replicate those merozoids into schizons and those schizons are little, almost like little sacs filled with the organism. And by when that expands, it actually kills the neurological cells and then it spreads the organism locally for further infection. So sometimes it will pick one side of the spinal cord over the other side. It's not a symmetric kind of distribution of the parasite. And that's why it's very classic to see asymmetric clinical signs in these horses. Gosh, it's a nasty booger. Yeah, they're tough little boogers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if we have a horse that presents either with these asymmetrical uh, lower motor neuron signs or central nervous system signs, what are some of the diagnostic tests or other diagnostic considerations we should keep in mind if we're suspecting EPM? I mean, certainly neurological presentations in horses can be a number of different things. So how do we kind of narrow that down? And you make a good point, Cassie. I think that you you nailed it right on the head. You know, there's different neurologic diseases that can look very similar. And I think that often veterinarians can skip like a complete physical exam, a complete neurological exam on these horses and ruling out all the diseases. You know, you have diseases such as West Nile virus, herpes virus, rabies, equine motor neuron disease, or even, you know, neck lesions, you know, horses with wobblers or they have arthritis of their neck. And, you know, you want to rule some of those out. And once you're able to rule those out, you have a neurologic exam that might be consistent with EPM. That's the right time to start resorting to, to blood and CSF testing at that point. So relying on that physical exam, I have to say, I've been guilty of that before of saying, oh, you know, it's presenting like X, Y, and Z, and it's so tempting to jump straight into testing. So good reminder of the importance of really getting our hands on an animal and making sure we're, we're doing a good assessment. 
I agree. It's, it's sort of like going back to vet school, right? They always tell you, don't forget to do the physical exam. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we do our, our physical exam mm -hmm. and we're still suspicious of EPM. Um, are there any specific tests that we can reach for? Yes. So the only definite way to know if a horse has EPM is postmortem, but that's not going to be very helpful to the horse owner and the horse that's still alive. So once we have our physical exam done, we rule out other diseases, then there is serologic testing. You know, so in those horses, um, we can do blood testing, which is easier. Um, but there is a very high incidence of the organism in different parts of the country. So the chances of having a positive test, a serological test on blood is as high as 85%. So if you sort of have a horse that meets EPM clinical signs, um, you know, test positive on the blood, the chance of having an accurate diagnosis is only about 55%. So now if you, you know, use these testings, such as the surface antigen test or the fluorescent antibody testing on these horses, but if you couple in these horses a CSF tap now, and you look at the ratios. So because of this organism, once it reaches the CNS, starts to replicate very quickly, you will have higher titers in the CSF fluid when you do a ratio compared to blood levels. And in those horses where you have a CSF tap that is multiple times a higher titer than the blood, in addition to clinical signs, your accuracy can go up to 95%. And is that true even if it's lower motor neuron disease? Yes. Okay. Okay, so there is something we can do anti-mortem, uh, just involves a CSF tap. Yeah, and I think that this is one of those moments we have to be fair to the, you know, to equine practitioners that are working there every day dealing with these cases, because once you, nobody likes to be called to a neurological horse. It's just not something that we look forward to. And now you get to the farm and you have a horse that is unstable, um, is neurologic. Sometimes they have trouble getting up. And then you say doing a CSF tap in the field is not an easy proposition on a standing horse, but do you would really want to lay down a neurological horse and recover him from anesthesia? No, you don't want to do that. So then you talk to the owner and you say, hey, I can refer you to an equine hospital that might be several hours away. And the owner's like, do you really want me to transport a neurological horse in a trailer? What if they fall down? And then people go like, I don't want to do that either. So sometimes people go back and say, okay, I have to rule out the other diseases that it could be. I do have a neurological exam that might be consistent and you might only have the blood titer and you might talk to the owner and say like, you know what? I just want to go ahead and treat this horse, which is okay as long as you offer the different options to horses. But if we go back and talk about gold standards, then unfortunately that CSF tap is part of that. I think that's a great, you know, really well-rounded answer to say, you know, this is really, you know, textbook medicine, like you said, gold standard, what we should do to get mm -hmm. this diagnosis. But when we're faced with a real life situation and a real life patient, uh, they don't always read the textbook and no. do what we need them to do. No. And then, you know, you have to face reality, right? Not everything we get to do the way we want, right? So sometimes it's that we need to meet the expectations of the owners, but I do feel that we need to discuss all the options always. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Um, so, you know, if we get to that point and we decide, okay, we're going to try to treat for EPM, we're yes. we have a high clinical suspicion for this or, or a diagnosis, um, what kind of treatment options are available? So we do have a few treatment options available, which is good. So we do have uh, three uh, types of drug that can be used. One is ponagerol. Um, the other one is a drug that's a combination of sulfadiazine and pyrimetamine. And then we also have protozil, um, which is the base uh, medication for that is diclagerol. Okay. That's not what I'm super familiar with. Can you talk a little bit more about protozil and how that one works? Yes. So protozil is a triazine antiprotozoal drug. It is highly selective against this organism. And it comes in a pelleted format. So it comes basically embedded in alfalfa pellets. So you basically, there's a small scoop in the bucket. You just scoop one of these scoops once a day and the horses readily eat that. And they're, they're receiving the medication that they need for, uh, for EPM. It's a very safe medication. Uh, we have done trials on this and fed it up to 50 times the dose uh, a day for 30 days without any major side effects in these horses. 
And the other thing that's pretty unique about this drug, it seems we live in an era where, you know, if something is sick, we want to be very quickly in how we address things. So for example, if a horse is colicking, you want to give your banamine IV, right? Because you want it to work right away. The neat thing about protozil is that even though they're just eating a little handful of alfalfa pellets, you will reach MIC in these horses within 12 hours. Wow. So so safe, effective, and fast acting is yes. what it sounds like. So the other drug on the market is Ponagero. It's a paste-based drug that comes in syringes. Um, it does require a loading dose um, initially to get a, to get to therapeutic levels. And very often people will co-administer um, corn oil to increase bioavailability of that medication. And then the other medication is a combination of sofa diazine and pyrimetamine. It works by interfering with folic acid metabolism and synthesis of nucleotides in Sarcosystis neurona. It's a once a day treatment, but it requires 90 to 270 days of treatment as opposed to 28 days for the other two medications. So that's a, that's a big difference. And I know that you said the protozil was given as a pelleted formulation. Um, Panazeril is a paste. Are they both given once a day? They're both given once a day and both those medications will, you know, the effective label dose treatment is 28 days. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So if, if we're able to get our treatment into these horses, which it sounds like, you know, with protozil doing a handful of alfalfa pellets seems like an easy enough thing to do. Uh, most horses are pretty amenable to paste, but it can be a little more challenging. Yes. Um, what kind of prognosis do these patients have? So the sort of the overall prognosis, and this is very important, you know, with these drugs, it's sort of the, the class of drugs has an overall response to treatment around 67%, but that is based on looking back at clinical signs in these horses. Various times, these horses will have, you know, enough nerve damage that they can recover completely because we are not repairing nerves with these medications. We are ridding the body of the organism that is causing the problem. Because in vitro example with protozoa, it's over 95% effective against the organism. So the 67% is a reflection of, you know, improvement in clinical signs. But another important number, Cassie, is that horses that get diagnosed with EPM and, and they get treated by these various medications only about 30% of those horses will go back to completely normal. So, you know, to have an accurate diagnosis and to initiate treatment as soon as possible is key to try to get your horses to be part of that 30% group. Yeah, those are those are not my favorite numbers that I've ever heard, but, you know, at least we are able to clear these organisms effectively. Um, and just to make sure I understood correctly, uh, the medications will get rid of the organism 95% of the time. Only 30% of horses, though, will return to to be clinically normal. What was the 67% again? It's the improvement. So you will have okay. horses that okay. can be grade three neurological, and they'll go back to grade two or grade one. So that is, you know, improvement in the, neuro the neurological status of these horses. But if we talk about a horse going back exactly the way he was before EPM, that is only about 30%. 67% of horses are going to improve and look much better than they did with EPM. Does that mean we have another another 33% that'll show no improvement? Potentially, yes. Wow. It's a very aggressive disease, you know? And if you think about it, if some of these horses can develop clinical signs fairly quickly and deteriorate very fast, you know, and sometimes if these horses go and diagnose for a week, 10, 14 days, and they have severe clinical signs, it is just irreparable damage to the neurologic system that, you know, that they cannot come back from anymore. I think that does a really good job of illustrating how serious this disease can be and how really jumping on treatment as soon as possible is, is incredibly important. Yes, that is that we cannot emphasize that enough. So for people to, you know, get their blood testing and their neurological exams done, you know, so that they can think started right away is is key to this disease. I mean, you mentioned how prevalent this organism is in the soil, um, in hay, and you know, once it's kind of on a farm, we know it's there. Once we get a horse that shows improvement, hopefully they're one of these sixty-seven percent. Can they get this disease again? They can. So they have shown, you know, once these horses terminate their, their treatments, uh, within a two-year period, 20% of horses that have had EPM before 
can get reinfected from the environment again, you know, by being exposed to the sporosis again, and they can relapse with the disease that way. Knowing that there's a percentage that are going to relapse, is there anything that we can do to prevent these infections or more importantly, prevent the clinical signs of EPM? Yes. So I think that going back to the basics, you know, even in these relapse cases, sort of decreasing stress on these horses, you know, offering them fresh water that are not infected with sporosis, don't feed these horses on the ground, especially in areas where opossums are very common, you know, and, and reduce the exposure to opossum feces, you know, that's a big component on it. So if you, whatever you can do that they are not ingesting high loads of sporosis is probably in the best interest of the horse. Can we use these medications as a preventative as well? Yes, the, there's some uniqueness to some of these medications in their pharmacokinetics. You know, the half-life of some those medications are very long, and there have been recent studies published, you know, in looking into that topic. But that is definitely an off-label use of these medications. But horse owners should go back to their veterinarians and discuss these different options, and those their veterinarians can definitely help them with that. Dr. Van Herbel, this has been a great conversation. I definitely needed a refresher on EPM. Um, I had some knowledge in the back of my mind, but thank you for, for such a comprehensive review and really appreciate you joining me and for all the great information. Oh, no problem. I really enjoyed talking and hopefully this can be of some help to some folks out there. Absolutely. And thank you to Merck for partnering with us for this edition of vet to vet Check out NAVCsVetfolio.com for more of our V2V discussions on various topics in veterinary medicine. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day. Important safety information. Use of protozole, 1.56% diclazoril, antiprotozoal pellets is contraindicated in horses with known hypersensitivity to diclazoril. Safe use in horses used for breeding purposes, during pregnancy, or in lactating mares has not been evaluated. The safety of protozil, 1.56% diclazoril, antiprotozoal pellets with concomitant therapies in horses has not been evaluated. For use in horses only, do not use in horses intended for human consumption, not for human use. Keep out of reach of children.